As we've been reporting, President Trump continues his disputes with China and the Federal Reserve as economic jitters grow. And three Democratic presidential candidates have now bowed out of the 2020 race. Here to help us understand the politics of it all are Shields and Panuru. That's syndicated columnist Mark Shields and Ramesh Panuru of the National Review. David Brooks is away. And hello to both of you on this Friday night. Um, we've got a lot going on and a lot to talk about. Mark, I'm going to start with you. Today, we, we started out with uh, China announcing uh, higher tariffs on, what, $75 billion worth of American mm -hmm. goods, somewhat expected. But then the president unleashed a barrage of criticisms, not only on China. By the end of the day, he had slapped new tariffs, said he was slapping new tariffs on more than $500 billion worth of Chinese goods. He was attacking the chairman of the Federal Reserve and on and on. What are we to make of it? I wish I knew, Judy. I, I really do. I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's a performance of uh, staggering uh, instability. More than anything else, uh, you look at you look at the president attacking uh, his own chairman of the Federal Reserve, and comparing, saying that his damage to the United States is greater than that, of a greater threat than that of Chairman Xi. Uh, you know, it, quite honestly, you know, China is a human rights abuser of, of historic dimensions. The million people who are Muslims right now in re-education camps, there's religious persecution abroad. I mean, this, this is so unfair, unjust, uh, and, and inaccurate. But at, at a larger sense, domestically, uh, it is it's unnerving. Uh, to the United States, uh, to those who want to invest in the country, employers who want to hire, want to expand. Uh, they're looking for predictability. They're looking for stability. They're getting absolutely none of that. Three times this week, the White House changed its position on a tax cut. Um, right. I, I, I wish I knew. I, I bet Ramesh has a lot better answer. <laughs> Massive instability, Ramesh? <laughs> well, you know, the president's tweets today attacking the Federal Reserve chairman that he himself appointed, uh, declaring China an enemy, but possibly not as much of an enemy as that appointee, were, th th they were appalling tweets. But one of the points he made was absolutely true, which is that China has abused the trade system. It's intellectual property theft, mm. it's forced technology transfers. Those are real abuses. The problem is Trump has created a problem for himself. He has backed himself into a corner. He has made a big part of his identity that he is going to be the president who, for the first time, takes those abuses seriously, holds the Chinese to account. And he's finding that the way he's done it, going unilaterally, going with, in with vague demands without even a unified team of his own negotiators is not working. And I think that is the frustration that is boiling up in these tweets and now boiling up in actual tariffs. So, so it, Mark, can we write it off then to just frustration with the, with the, the problems that he's had inside his administration? I, well, I, mean, I mean, Judy, every every presidency, uh, you know, and I've, I've been through 11 of them now, is is basically a mirror reflection of the man at the top, um, and eventually will be the woman at the top. But the strengths and weaknesses of that individual. This is, I mean, Donald Trump. The, the pattern is familiar by now. He finds somebody, they're the best, because he knows the best, and they're the best people want to work for him, and he hires them. He praises them to the sky. <clears throat> they get in trouble. He loses confidence. He, he banishes them to the outer darkness. I mean, outstanding Americans like General Jim Mattis and, and others have just served, served their country, and, and, and been gone. I mean, it, so the instability begins right at the top. But, but, but I mean, even on top of that, which is something I discussed earlier with Catherine, and Rampell, Ramesh, and that is his ordering, in a tweet, ordering American companies to stop doing business with China. I mean, and of course, presidents can't do that. Presidents don't have that kind of authority. But I suppose if you're the sort of person who thinks that as president you should just be able to say something and it happens, that that would add to your frustration. But does this help him politically, all this? I don't think so. I think that it is undermining the economy. Um, the reaction of the stock market suggests they don't believe that people who have, with real money on the line do not believe that this is going to produce Chinese concessions that are going to be worth it for the economy going forward. And I do think that as, as fashionable as it is to say that nothing can dent President Trump's approval ratings, the one thing that could is a weakening economy. And, and you're saying this could... Let me, let me just back. pick up on Ramesh's point, because I think it's a good one. Uh, Judy, the, the final analysis, it's a personal assessment people make of their president. 
And it was a very simple four-part question that's been asked for the past 45 years. I like the president personally, and I agree with most of his policies. I like the president personally, disagree. I dis dislike the president, don't agree, dislike the president, agree. With Ronald Reagan, 75% of Americans liked him. Liked him. That, that's a formidable job when you're trying to unseat somebody. Whatever they thought. That's of right. His Even policy. Bill Clinton is going through the Monica Lewinsky in, in impeachment was at 73% approval rating, uh, and with 65% liking him. Donald Trump, Donald Trump, with the lowest unemployment in 50 years, has 30% of Americans who like him. Who like him. So th that's the benefit of the doubt he has going. And I, I just, I really think he's in enormous political trouble. And I think he understands that. And I think that's anxiety generating in him. Well, let's turn. I mean, there's a lot to say about all that happened today and you know, the Federal Reserve and, and China. But let's, let's spend a few minutes talking about the Democrats. Ramesh, uh, we lost three, three more of the, I guess you could say, the, the candidates who hadn't really caught on this week today. Seth Moulton, the congressman from Massachusetts, announced he's not running. But you still have a good 20 plus candidates in the race. Where does this Democratic race stand right now? Has it firmed up? Is it, is it all over the map? How do you see it? Well, I think that Vice President Biden has shown stronger staying power than people might have thought, um, even after that first debate where um, he seemed to be rattled by Senator Kamala Harris's attack mm -hmm. on him. He has maintained his leadership of the polls. He's maintained, I think, very importantly, a multiracial coalition. You don't need one of those to win a Republican presidential nomination. You do to win a Democratic presidential nomination. Mm -hmm. And right now, he's doing better among blacks and Hispanics than he is among white voters, and there's nobody else really at the top level of the of the party who can say that they've got a similarly broad coalition. So, you know, he, he's writing maybe a little too much on electability. Maybe he doesn't have enthusiastic support, but I still think you might rather be him than any of the other candidates. How do you see this Democratic race? Well, I, I, Bob Strauss, the great Democratic chair, said once that uh, tough, toughest thing is not to announce that you're running for president, throw your hat in the ring and take a chance. Toughest thing is to admit you've lost and to withdraw. Uh, and that takes an awful lot of guts to do it. Um, and so the people who left, uh, Hickenlooper in Colorado and Inslee in Washington, were people of accomplishment. I mean, they had been governors, they'd been mayors, they'd had, they had record of, of achievement. I mean, my bias for executives versus legislators is, is admitted. Um, and, and so I, I think they're, they're a loss to the party in, in that sense. Um, and, uh, you know, Congressman Moulton launched a challenge to Nancy Pelosi for the speakership in, in the presidential nomination did just about as well. And they all have to get back to trying to get elected. And that's what uh, Senator, what uh, Mayor Governor Heck Looper is trying to do right now in Colorado. So he's running in Colorado. He's running in Colorado Senate. for the Senate. So, you know, I, I, I think, Judy, that uh, Ramesh's analysis is pretty solid. Uh, Joe Biden is running on electability. The only drawback to electability is you have to win. Um, and if you don't win Iowa and you don't win New Hampshire, um, then your electability, even though it looks good in November, is, is underlined. Uh, I think anybody who looks at the Democratic race has to be impressed by what Elizabeth Warren has done. She came in under the worst of circumstances, self-created, um, and forswore any big money. Uh, she's managed to... Took a lot raise, of criticism. Took a lot President of criticism, has raised, has raised money, has generated enthusiasm and, and great response, and her numbers are up. And Kamala Harris' numbers... Uh, she went after Joe Biden. She she was the one that hit him. Uh, she belled that cat, and she's paid for it. I mean, she's her own numbers have shrunk in the me, in the in the meanwhile. Last thing I want to ask you both about is what uh, we just heard in that report from John Yang, and that's the legacy of David Koch. Here you have a multi-billionaire uh, Ramesh who gave millions and millions. I don't know what the total is to conservative causes as well as to to charitable causes. What's his legacy in American politics? Well, I think that he was able to move the needle on some issues, not so much conservative issues as libertarian issues where a lot of conservatives weren't with him. But he was a principled libertarian, and he supported drug legalization. He supported... Um, Which a lot of people don't remember. That's right. Supported same-sex marriage. He gets a lot of criticism from the left, but because of those principles, he was willing to work with liberals on those issues. I think, though, his death comes at a time when that philosophy is waning 
in America, when the, both, libertarian. the libertarian philosophy, the small government philosophy, you see Republicans like Donald Trump moving in the direction of tariffs and immigration control, and you see Democrats moving in the direction of national health insurance, Green New Deal. So you do wonder whether this death is maybe a little bit more symbolic. I met uh, David Cope when 1980 was a vice presidential nominee on the libertarian ticket. Uh, a party that was dedicated to the abolition of the federal income tax, a de a abolition of child labor laws, um, and, the, and the repeal of Medicare. Um, he is uh, proof of the golden rule in American politics. He who has the gold rules. They put in hundreds of millions of dollars. They put in dark money. It was it, it was against any disclosure. Money that, uh, was, money that was not revealed. Not um, yeah. And uh, Judy, whether uh, you're talking about uh, opposition to clean air laws or clean water laws um, and, and the libertarian philosophy, yes, but uh, there's no question about it. The, the, the air is less clean and the water is less clean. And, uh, you know, I just I, I just think that uh, uh, with the, the dark money, we talk about climate change. You saw Brazil today. The, the, the two are bookends, that, that and, and the Koch brothers and what they've done politically. But your point, Ramesh, is the money moved the needle, uh, at least to some extent, on it, some it of these huge a lot of people, issues. A lot of state legislators. And advocacy as well. Mm -hmm. Mark Shields, Ramesh Panero. Good to have you both. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.